Okay, this is the Placeholder Podcast. Um, I'm here today with Nathaniel Smart, and we're here to talk about uh, this new treatment he wrote for a, a series idea uh, called The Middles. Um, uh, hello, Nathaniel. How are you doing today? Hey, man. All right, you're doing well. That's great to hear. Um, so to prep for this interview, I, I reread the, the entire treatment uh, once more today. And first thing that jumped out to me was that it's very reminiscent of your own uh, life and experience. And one thing that I've typically noticed with most, maybe not first time writers, but a lot of writers who are trying to get their start is they typically write specifically things that have happened in their own lives, things that they've been through. And I just wanted to know, um, why did you choose that avenue to go down and what do you think it, uh, how do you think you succeed in doing so? I chose that avenue to go down because when I came up with the show I did, it was loosely based on my life. So yes, it was with the intent and purpose to mirror my life in some aspects, not all of them, but um, I also write comedy, which is very personal. So that's kind of what I'm used to. But I also do go out of my range and write things that have nothing to do with me or anything to my likeness. So I just felt it was important to tell this very, um, very interesting story of somebody who is living amongst strangers, um, for lack of a better term, with his significant other in the town he went to school in, trying to figure out the next step. I just thought that was interesting. But that is not all that I do. Uh, I have many other ideas that have nothing to do with me in general. All right. That's interesting. That's interesting. Okay. So when you say, or when you, when you speak about um, writing something about a, a man living with a, a near or around a bunch of strangers looking for the next step, uh, that's not necessarily what I got when I read it. When I read it, it, it felt more like, um, uh, yeah, we, we when we talked prior to the interview, you mentioned Atlanta as a chief influence, and that's a show that's very episodic, where each episode kind of builds a world but doesn't necessarily have a, a through line towards a specific point. Um, when you were writing this, was your point necessarily to build to uh, to craft a narrative where you're definitely leading towards a conclusion, or was it just to essentially fill out the world of the characters that you've uh, imagined? Well, I don't think that's true about Atlanta. I think they definitely have a point that they're trying to get and it with a base story. Um, it's surrounded by the world of Atlanta and everything else, but there is a very um, linear plot line going where Earn is trying to make money however he can, and the opportunity he saw fit was to manage his budding rapper cousin, Paperboy, and that's the story of Atlanta. And he's trying to make money for his daughter and cultivate a relationship with his baby mama. That's a story. Now, they throw a lot of curveballs at you and give you what we call in the industry bottled episodes, um, where it has nothing to do with the linear story, but the linear story is the story. So that is very much what the focus is. Well, well, well we're not here to talk about Atlanta for one. <laughs> well, well, because you, I thought you made a false statement so i just want well, to what, that. Well, what you're what you're uh, explaining is a premise that is not okay. the narrative of the show the, the show premise. isn't the, the plot show. of the show is not those I, I, things. That's, that's, I think that's essentially the the wrap around what the show is about that's, as a whole i think the plot of the show is them earn specifically trying to make money by managing his rapper the rapper paper boy Yes, but, but like I said, that's a premise. That's not what the show is about, but, and that's not show, what every episode is about. That's what the show is about, but I also said it also encompasses the world of Atlanta, so it does throw in bottle episodes that shows you the world of Atlanta. But the main story is him trying to get money. That's what the story is about. Well, but um, we're, we're here to argue about Atlanta. We, you, you we can go back to your question. Though. What did you specifically? What did you feel like your story was building up to, and what was the the point? of the narrative moving forward. My story is essentially to show that aspect of living in a house with others and your significant other in this very, um, I guess, rural part of Mississippi that a lot of people don't know about. So that's, uh, that in itself is part of the story, but also just navigating through um, what a young 20 something year old is trying to do and the steps one takes trying to deem what he finds as success, especially for, uh, really for the people around him. 
and how he deals with feeling lost and feeling inadequate. So that's also part of it. But yes, it's mainly the the world itself, which is uh, Mississippi as a whole, the dynamic of living in a house with a few other people that you don't know, along with your significant other and his friend group who often is in the mix. And also the angst of a 20 something year old trying to figure out what he has to do next. Um, that all wraps up to be basically what the show is of itself. And, um, I wish I could tell you the story about how I came up with the name, but I can't remember it now, but the, the middles does pose some significance to what the story is. Um, I just can't remember the story when it came to my head. It just kind of came randomly, and I just it's slipping my mind right now. But yes, okay, very interesting, very interesting. Um, so when I was reading through some of the the, the scripts, um, there were a few sentences that one well, a, a sentence per script that always stood out to me. I thought it was particularly well written and kind of said a lot about uh, the character. So in the first one, or at least about you as a writer. So in the first one, I saw I read. Uh, the, the the line was... What's the name of the episode? Well, it's one per episode, so this is the first episode. Uh, so what's the name of that episode? The name of the first episode? Yes. Uh, Boredom at its finest, I believe. Okay, I, I just wanted you to tell the people... Uh, oh, the oh, okay, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, it's fine. It says, uh, even in broad daylight, this is where no black man wants to be. I thought that was an interesting uh, little take on what the circumstances were at the moment uh, in episode two smart water visions there was a line that says this is this was his way out courtesy of his love i thought that was nice elegant sentence and then the last one which was mucho de Nero, the sentence was he was at he was at some type of peace but not too far off from where he stays mentally now i point these out essentially to Point out that these were moments of like elegance where you stepped outside of the character in order to comment on the situation, and uh, I just really enjoyed those moments of a brief ref- requisite, essentially because most of the scripts or most of the treatment rather were essentially action and defining what was happening and what the the focus of the scene was thinking about. So I just thought those were nice moments. Well, I appreciate that. You know, uh, very much later that show will be once it's done. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd like to cite one thing. Uh, so currently at the moment I'm reading uh, the novel White Teeth by Zadie Smith. She's a fascinating um, British writer. I believe she's Ethiopian descent. She is a, a uh, 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 whatever, you get the point. But only to uh, essentially, you know, drive a fine point on the idea that I think a, a single sentence can say a lot of, one about a writer, but also one about what the writer wants to impart on what their story means. So here's a here's a sentence from that novel, just one sentence that I think is particularly well written and says a lot about the quality of the writer and who he is and what the story is about. So she says, Claire Bowden was beautiful in all the senses except maybe by virtue of being black, the classical. I thought that was a really elegant and one with such a, a brief mention of like the character and her looks says a lot about not only her as a person, but the culture which which she exists in, and then and you know that's what led me to point out the the, the the sentence per episode. But uh, getting away from that, I'd like to focus on something else. So, in the final episode, which is Mucho Dinero, that you have written, or at least that I have, and you know, copy here, uh, yeah. you, you tend to this episode is essentially about a single character, not from the point of view of the main character that we've met so far. What was the point of doing that specific for? The Cheney character versus anybody else, you know. Well, Cheney was specifically the last person introduced because he would be the fall to the main character, Tebe. Um, oh, so it's and, Tebe, it's not Thebe. No, it, it, it's a, uh, it's a uh, Tebe. Oh, okay, cool. Go ahead, sir. Um, he would be the foil to the entire, I guess. Not even just Tebe physically, but I guess to the entire nature of the show, of what Tebe represents in the show, which is uh, kind of like hope, but also a confusion and uh, fear. Like um, Cheney represents the exact opposite. So um, he's very much he very much knows what the next step is. He, he very much has all his wits about him. He, he's very much not very much scared of anything, mm-hmm. and um, 
it shows in that episode. And I, the reason I fought it, the reason he was the last one to show, and I gave him entire episode because he would be the foil to what Tebe is, and it, it, it's, it's almost like two different worlds in one world. So you have Tebe's side of things, and even how he looks at things, and then you have Cheney's side, while not realizing the whole time that they're very much similar as they are very much alike. So, um, th- that contrast makes for something there, and um, th- I guess that, that contrast and comparison makes for something there. So, I gave Cheney the entire third episode to introduce him to the people and to show them that this is the exact opposite of Tebe while they share a lot of the same qualities. And that's some- sometimes our, our biggest fears, like, well, not our biggest fear, but one of the more frustrating things about people is that you see a lot of yourself as somebody you don't want to see a lot of yourself in. Mm-hmm. So, it, it, even coming from two completely different places, they ended up in the same place, and they're so much alike and different at the same time. And Tebe will have a hard time um, e- even coming to terms with a lot of that, as he does while admitting it. If you asked him, he would still he would admit it, but it's still something he doesn't like, and it shows in how him and Cheney will um, interact with each other. Yeah, and. And yes, I think uh, Cheney's probably the second most important character in the whole, uh, uh, at least the whole first season of the middles. Okay, interesting. Um, so me, me, just as a consumer of media and art and things of that nature, I tend to find that uh, I tend to find that most stories about people writing about their own lives, whether it be their friends, their experiences, the world they grew up in, either tends to be um, interesting in the sense that it offers insight into places that we've never been before, or it tends to be pretty unsuccessful because it there's no there's no drama, there's no conflict. So, and, and so they essentially believe that their lives are interesting enough to support the narrative of a film, a movie, a TV show, a book, um, without really uh, digging into the interior lives of those around them. And while I don't think that's the case for your story, of course, I do think. Only maybe only because there's three episodes in, we don't get to know the the supporting cast as well as we know uh, Tebe and and Chain. Uh, do you see uh, episodes moving forward about maybe bottle episodes about any specific character, or maybe just about like filling out the cast as a whole together with more personality away from strictly the POV of uh, Tebe and how he interacts with these people? Well, it's not just his show, like. Uh remember what I was saying about how like it's, it's three different parts mm-hmm. and one of them being the world itself and the world um, last time I checked did have those other characters in it so yes you will see a bottle episode with Frankie you will see bottle episodes with other people um, throughout the show and, and um, if it's not just bottle episodes you will see them being the focus in, or um, at least which is something I really want to do you'll see how they see Tebe like you're, you're gonna see a lot of the show from his point of view cause you know he's the main character but you're going to see uh, points in times when y- you see him and the world through somebody else's eyes, maybe Chaney, and it might um, change your idea of Tebe or, or other characters because of it. So I do think the point of view will change from time to time, and, mm-hmm. and we will have episodes dedicated to other people because it's, it's not just about Tebe. It is about th- this world that they live in. He just so happens to be the main focus, but you do have others who will also be that get that spotlight like Cheney did in Richard De Niro, you just have to wait for the next um, pieces to come out because they, they haven't yet. Um, so within the past year, I'd seen a film titled uh, It Happened in L.A. And it was essentially uh, a woman's basically writing uh, a heightened detailed account, maybe not detailed account, but a heightened account of uh, kind of the broad generalizations of the people she'd met in L.A. in her life in L.A. And I thought... Um, for the most part, it was a charming film and, you know, it didn't really make much of an impression, but it was uh, her life transcribed, but in a way that was um, done in such a way that is more of a uh, more of a fantasy in the fantasy realm rather than a film about specifically realism. And in that same vein, uh, a film like but in the same vein, but in a, going further in that direction, a movie like The Lore is a Polish musical about mermaids. Where the where the woman who wrote and directed the film basically said that the film is about her life, but that in order to separate herself so it didn't feel so personal, she put in the music and she made it about the mermaids. 
so it could be her life, but through the prism of these fantastical elements. Um, do you yourself find find that using that sense of like heightened realism or or fantasy altogether to be attractive for telling stories specifically about your life? I do like that. I do think that um, you have to heighten the realism a little bit. I actually like to use surrealism and realism at the same time. Um, being a big fan of Atlanta, um, I just like what they did with that idea. But um, I didn't want to do the same thing. I wanted to flip it on its head. But I think that um, realism and surrealism goes hand in hand because it's like something you said earlier. A lot of your life is probably mundane and um, will not be interesting enough to actually craft an entire show or series or movie around or film around. Yeah. But um, but it's it's realism. It's realistic in that a lot of times stuff isn't happening. But then then that's when you at the surrealism to kind of prove a point about something you're trying to say. So um, adding surrealism to a real situation will will get a point across that otherwise wouldn't be there. So yes. I kind of like I kind of like that idea of work where um, you you make it as grounded and real as possible, but if need be. You add some surrealism, something that maybe otherwise wouldn't happen. Not not for the fact of being just you know sci sci fi or just being different, but to prove a point of sorts and um to use the the tool of realism as a vessel to convey a message that you otherwise couldn't because it's so realistic and that it might be mundane. That's when you inject it with a little bit of surrealism, and then it's actually a story or it's something you can actually then talk about in a script setting. So. I like to kind of merge those two worlds, and that's what I'm trying to do with my show. Um, so when reading through the first three episodes, uh, I saw, like, the first episode, Boredom at Its Finest, was essentially a, a series of vignettes uh, that the main character uh, found himself involved in before eventually getting to this ultimate conclusion or where he ended up based on where he meant to journey at the beginning. And um, with the second episode, Smart Water Vision, that's an episode that almost feels like a a kind of heightened uh, transcription of what actually occurred when the show conception and the idea for the episodes were written or thought that they could have been conceived. And the final episode is, I believe, I mean, you could tell me if I'm wrong, a completely fictional account of a day in the life of the Cheney character who I know is based on someone in your real life. So all that to say is, um, do you feel as though... Hmm, what am I trying to say? I had it and I lost it. Um, professionally. Oh, okay. Do you feel as though? Uh, okay. Yes, I know what I was going to say. I'm gonna cut all this out. But um, do you think that what in these episodes do you feel like you're working through or you're trying to discover about yourself, or do you think that these aren't necessarily a reflection of your own thoughts and they are themselves? just these separate beings that come from your creativity? Do you feel like when you read them or when you write them that you're exploring something or that you're bringing out something that you just need to get out on paper? Well, the idea itself of me just needing to get it out on paper, but mm -hmm. each individual episode has its own meaning and its own um, idea while also being, like I kind of say, you know, loosely based on what I've gone through, what I'm going through. So, for, for example the beginning of um water smart water visions i do i did at the time was running very um uh, actively and now i didn't take smart water with me i don't think ever but i walked to the gas station one day and got a small water and you know it was kind of just playing off of the fact that th this water isn't different than any other water but because of the label it's supposed to be better and I just I flipped that on his head and made it like give me these like um, astronomical powers of creativity almost mm -hmm. to, to kind of push the point further. But then at the end, the, the entire flip is I had nothing, or or I did, but it wasn't good, and no amount of small water was gonna make what I was writing good. So you have that, but at the same time, I do run and I have drunk a small water. So you know it, it's it's like I said, it's loosely based on what I've been through while adding the, the, the surrealism of, like, you know, imagery and things of that nature to prove a point. So each episode has a point, while also just loosely being on stuff that I've endeared in my life. And, um, yes, uh, every episode will probably be something to that magnitude. But while I move forward, I think I might make it a little less about me and a little more about 
a point. So so it will be just be episodes based on my creation, but the backdrop will be um basically everything we talked about to this point and loosely my life. So um I think I'm gonna get away from my story just a touch or or, or while also keeping it in there so you can understand what the show is but um yes every every episode has its own idea its own life its own meaning and it kind of takes it takes on a life a form of itself so it it, it just so happens that the backdrop for each one it will be you know my life loosely and everything that goes on with tebe and uh, all of his surroundings so okay Interesting, interesting. So the episode uh, Mucho Dinero about the Cheney character was that based on just the 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 uh, uh, a fictional account of the goings of a, of a character or a person that you knew, or was it something that you knew actually happened? So you just essentially wrote your version of it. It's a little bit of both. It's it's it's, it's loosely based on somebody that I know, but it's also story. Just it's also. What, what I've seen and what I've experienced. So it's like, you know, n- n- not me personally, but what I've seen. So it's like, and also at the same time, it, it's more of an embodiment. Like th- this show is an embodiment of what goes on um, in this v- very specific place in the United States that doesn't get a lot of attention. So and it's a lot of different characters. Like mm-hmm. it, it's, it's, not, it's not a big town at all. Yes. You know, a, a lot of probably don't know much about the state of Mississippi as a whole. So when I take you into these places and I show you these people, you have to understand, like, these are real people and these are real happenings. So it's like, the show itself is an embodiment, but that character is, is loosely based on someone and um, really events and things that I know. But at the same time, I'm sure it's a lot of people that do those things in Mississippi that I just don't know. But that's the point, you know, it's, it's, um, the state itself is its own character. And I, and I, and I definitely try to keep that in mind about the inhabitants. And, and, and what I will introduce in the next episodes going forward is like outside people affecting the main life, people, the main character people to show that the state of Mississippi itself is also a character, which will have lasting effects, um, mentally or physically on our main character cast. Um, the state itself is a character and it will have its place. So I think that you're going to see a lot more of that in episodes to come. Mm, yes. Okay. Very good. Very good. Um, so are there any, are there any uh, other touchstones that you have found other than Atlanta, whether that be film, television, books, you know, YouTube channels, any sort of media in that way? Um, None for this show, but I will say the album, um, some rap songs by Earl Sweatshirt is heavily influenced this show. And I got yeah. the idea. There's a mention in episode two about listening to Earl Sweatshirt that came to mind. Yes. Um, it is it, definitely, it, it definitely came about because of this, um, uh, it, it, the, part of the, the reason of this show being exist is because of that album and how it affected me. Um, upon listening to it a few times, mm-hmm. I didn't at first and then it just kind of grew on me and it's very um abstract in its sound and all those kind of things and it's very uh detailed and and layered in what he's trying to say and i just tried to incorporate that into it so that's on gives a lot of what this album i mean what, what this show is and just music in general i just listen to a lot of music when i when i write it so whatever song i'm listening to that day of that time it'll find its way in essence in the episode i'm sure just through you know um create creativity so um i'm not sure about any movies or any or any tv or anything Mm -hmm. that watch that add to this but um i do know music plays a big part and um like 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 we've already said atlanta plays a big part and um just just things like that I i don't know really i don't know any other like tv shows or anything like that that will play a big part but um i will say um I did watch No Country for Old Men recently, and I just love that movie. And uh, mm-hmm. the the uh, what? Great film. That's all. Go ahead. The, uh, it, no, it, it is the f- f- fictitious character of Anton Shiger, um moved me, and um, I'm I'm not going to do anything like that. But I would love to have somebody who um, embodies something so, so strongly as he does in that film in my show. So, or um, 
something of the same ilk and um or or um in general. So um I I, I definitely enjoyed that movie and I, and I think it's a great film and it, it definitely inspired me to to just deepen and, and layer my um my thing, my work a little bit further. That's great to hear, great to hear. Um so I, I know that we're talking about the series at the moment and the treatments that you uh, graciously supplied to me in order for reference. Uh, are there any story ideas you have maybe from some other series or maybe even a, a movie idea or a web series, anything on your mind at the moment? Um, I do a lot of comedy writing, so um, that that's also coming. Um, just playing with a lot of things that goes on in society today. Yes, yes. Uh, I do. I have an idea for a movie about. Um, it's called Innocuous. It's about a, a movie director and his wife um, getting these um, four films, um, not greenlit, but he's getting the opportunity to direct the, 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 this four movie series. And you see how he um, he himself becomes part of the movie in essence as it slowly um, t- 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 takes away his psyche and. Um, and peace of mind, and he just kind of delves deeper and deeper into what he's going through, and it affects his marriage in a very um, hostile way. And by the end of the movie, you know he's um, you know he he he's all over the place. But I don't want to get into that. But you, you don't see that coming, and um, it's called a, it's called an innocuous for a reason. And you know you you'll you'll figure all that out upon seeing it or, or, or reading it or whatever. But um, I have that. And um, I'm I'm constantly thinking about things, you know. I, I just have a lot of ideas in my head. I haven't written anything down, but it'll come um, when it comes. I'm, f- I'm focused on the middles right now, and then I get some of my stand up writing. So I think uh, that's about it right now. <laughs> um, so in order to wrap things up, I'm just going to end with a quick little fun question. So, sir, are you familiar with the Criterion Collection at all? No. Okay, let's end with a fun one. Um, so the Criterion Collection is essentially an independent, I, I believe, I believe it's independent, an independent uh, distributor who that uh, essentially um, remasters and re redistributes older films or classical films or international films or films that they're able uh, to essentially, what do you call it, uh, acquire currently. So, um, for instance, um, I was able to buy... The Decalogue, which is a on Criterion Blu-ray, which is a ten-episode French language uh, film about the Ten Commandments that came out in the 1980s. But I was also able to buy Personal Shopper on Criterion, which is a 2017 movie horror movie starring Kristen Stewart. So they, you know, a lot, lot of variety there. Uh, lot, mostly high-class stuff, so stuff kind of like specialty delivers and things like that, more collectible items than anything else with commentaries and remastered audio and, and visuals. But within every Criterion disc that you buy, and there's over a thousand now, and they keep on adding new movies to the to the, to the the collection, um, there's a booklet. And in that booklet, uh, a, a famous film critic or a, a, a director who's a fan of that other director who has the film, they tend to write a, a small essay or a write-up about a movie, and that is included with the Criterion Collection. So with every criterion I have, I have about 10 or 12. Each one has a, a small essay that is about, you know, 10 to 20 pages written by a person who is a fan of that film from the industry. Critic, director, actor, who, whomever, just a good writer. Um, so if there was ever a film to be in, to be inducted into the Criterion Collection, what, what would you want that film to be that you would want to have commentaries from the cast and crew, you know, better picture quality, better audio, and what, and what film would you also want to write an essay for that you feel like you could do 10 to 20 pages of a booklet in a criterion release um man uh, I it guess. could be a tv show as well but it would have to be a limited series a la say maniac or something on netflix the most recent so yeah so so, so basically if i could write an essay what would i write it on yeah, what movie and like what would you want to see as a Criterion release? Uh, criterion release, you know. What's that's the basically criteria? it. Again, I'm sorry. I so said, what is a Criterion release again? It's essentially just a specialty release of any film that has like new updated information. So 
the Six Lies and Videotape one I have has a new commentary by Steven Soderbergh, the director. The movie came out in 1989, has new interviews by the cast and crew on the disc. It has better picture quality than it ever has before, better audio, it sounds better, and it just has, it comes packaged really nicely, and it comes with that essay I mentioned. So what film would you want to see with that kind of level of release with all these new features added that you can, you know, indulge in? And also, mm-hmm. in that same release, what movie did you feel like you could write a 10 to 20 page essay on? And it would be substantial to be included with the criteria release. Um, I would love to watch. I would love to read a um, a Bill Street one. Um, if Bill Street could talk, uh, a movie I had seen. I don't know if I could write twenty pages on it, but I would love to see somebody else just to see what they say. And I think that that would be very interesting. Uh, I think that movie is very powerful and it has a lot it can offer. Now, if I had to write twenty pages on something, it would be No Country for Old Men. I could talk about Anton Shiger's character for days, and then if I add in the, the elements of um, A. Llewellyn Moss and, the, and and Sheriff Bell, I could write 25 to 30 pages just on that movie alone and the Coen Brothers' impact. So um, I'll probably do that one for, for a Criterion series, mm-hmm. but I would love to um, if Bill Street could talk. I think so. uh, that that would be great, but if I had to do one myself, it'd be Control, man. I just think that movie's great and has a lot in depth that... um that could be talked about so oh wow very interesting very interesting um just just my own personal question um you mentioned Llewellyn moss and um uh, in no country for old men have you seen the coen brothers film that came after no country for Win called inside lewin davis no i have not seen that movie no okay great great well this is a great conversation it was great to talk to you mr smart um you're i think you have a lot of talent as a writer and i really enjoyed reading what you sent me Oh, um, you know, I appreciate it. Uh, I think I'm talented as well, and I think I'm about to do a lot of great wow. things. Huh? Uh, just very, very confident. That's all. Well, I, you know, I, I, if you can't believe in yourself, who's going to believe in you, right? <laughs> That's very true. <laughs> so I, I think I'm. I, I think I have greatness ready to okay. show. So it's going to be good. But I, I appreciate your questions, and uh, thank you for having me today. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right, everybody, that was the Placeholder Podcast with my guest Nathaniel Smart on his uh, on the treatment for his uh, forthcoming television show, The Middles. Uh, this is Brian Bashley here signing off. Thank you, guys. Well, that's going to be real cool. You should have been recording. Well, I got, I got stuff to do later, too. I can't. You know, no, but I'm, 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 I'm recording now, so. Please hold it. Uh, so, so what you think about the uh, Revenge of the Dreamer sessions? You excited? I don't give a fuck about that shit. Do you not really? <laughs> when it come out, I'll listen. No, I did get enamored with it. Just seeing Cole write in a real book. He always does that. No, I know, but it, and then like seeing the picture like him with his head, and his head in his hands. I was like this nigga really like thinking. And then they say he was like on the same beat for like six hours. Yeah, that's what uh, Chase did, the, the videographer who's been taking all the pictures and stuff there. He's just and, like, and yeah, Cole was writing for, on one beat for six hours. And I thought about this all the because I was writing raps last the other night. I just get inspired and I just want to write. And I find raps on YouTube or instrumentals I like and just write to them. And Man, so I be thinking, spot and he thought he'd be. Go ahead. Okay. Do you want me to talk or what? <laughs> and I, be, I be wanting instant gratification. Like, I be wanting, like, I'd be like, damn, why ain't this good yet? And I'd be like 10 minutes in. Then I saw it and I was like, let's go back to that patience thing I was telling you about. Mm-hmm. I need to I need to find patience in everything that I do and know that things will not just happen like in a, in a click of the finger. You got to take things. To, I'm, I'm kind of dope, though. I ain't going to lie to you. I agree. I, I get body on it. I body a nigga, though, for real. So you so you saying, if they, if they said step up to these sessions, you... you, you Shit. Mean, if Cole, if Cole said, I want you on the opening track with me, you said, I got you. I say, send me the beat and give me some days. I'll come up with yeah, something. Like, the send you the beat and get your head down to Atlanta. I said, shit, you better fly me. You better send a car, nigga. I guess that man said he don't want to be on Revenge of the Dreams. But nah, but, but, um, and I was, I, was, I was thinking, how do you come up with such rhyme schemes and stuff like that when you listen to a beat over and over? How do you, like, incorporate which line going to go where and, like, where you gonna stop and like when you gonna pick it back up? And we gonna change flow when it's the, when the beats over and over. I guess you do that in the recording process. No, you do that when you write it. <laughs> what do you mean? But I'm saying like, cause I 
Fuck, you don't know. You don't write rap. But I've written rap. And, and so it's like, it's very, it's a hard thing to do to figure out, like, where to cut and where to stop, where to, where to pause and, like, um, how flow's supposed to be and to put it on the beat. And, like, I don't know. I just find trouble, like, with a beat continuously on because I guess I'd be thinking about, like, okay, like, how long did this need to be and all that kind of stuff. But I guess you just write it out. I don't know. I, I just would love to be in there with, like, a top-tier rapper to see how they do it. I would assume it would depend on the, the content he's writing about, right? Like, a song like Change, that first part is very specifically, like, the same kind of rhyme scheme all the way through, kind of just bouncy and smooth and easily understood, yeah. versus something like uh, Immortal, which is, like, the first verse is very, very hard-hitting, but, like, very much about punchlines, but then the second verse is, like, a buildup of this kind of, like, narrative of uh, chants, or not chants, but a narrative of uh, proclamations. And it's not necessarily a, like a, a punchline verse. It's a verse about uh, like a, like the screams of a person, uh, of an arrogant person. So, you know, I mean, depending on how you, what you're writing about, I guess it depends on how you would rap it, right? Like if you were if you're rapping a real sad song about like, a woman, you probably want to make sure you can hear the words. You wouldn't be like, nah, 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 you know what I'm saying? Like, you might just be different. Maybe, but like I think there's a reason why like something like Off the Zoinkies is like a bit more casually laid out than something like Slick Talk where he just, you know what I'm saying? Like, that's like spitting, spitting, but he don't really spit like them off the zonkies, but it's a, it's arguably a better song to me, you know? I, I think off the zonkies is, might be the best song in that album to me. I think it is. That, that music with his rapping, and he's just very like, and it's not even like him spazzing. It's just like, he just talk he ain't playing in the, you ain't saying, like, it's just really good. Like, that's what I'm saying. I guess it depends on what you're trying to say. But but yeah, I think uh, rapping is hard. It's one of the hardest things to do, and to do it good. I don't think so. I think rap is pretty good. Have you ever wrote a rap in your life? Yeah, I have. Like, if we're talking about, like, strict punchline rap, which seems like that's all people want, you can probably, you can probably do that pretty easy. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, you can find, like, a kid in Wisconsin who rapped, like, a, a super tight 16. It's like, no, they get, this girl got bars. But if you ask her to, like, write a song or compose an album, she probably couldn't do it. I don't think even writing the sixteen is, uh, with punchlines is easy. I think it's fairly easy if you take the t- if you if you gave me like a day like next day we recording sixteen bars you got one day to write it. I bet you I can come up with like the tightest sixteen bars you've ever heard. You know who can't? Who can't? Flight Club. No, I'm just you take that out. <laughs> no, nah, that's gonna stay. Uh, but no, I think I think if, if Willie actually really tried, he could probably write a good sixteen. I think I, what they're doing is very specifically intentional. That they ain't trying I don't, to spin. No, because, no, because cause they're not even trying to sound beat. Exactly. I just think they just having fun. Like they ain't even trying to sound good. That's part of it, right? No. Oh, well. But um, but yeah, I think the Dreamville stuff is cool. I'm ready, just ready for it. But I don't care about that shit. It's it's long in the tooth now. Cause Lindsay keep showing every damn thing, and I'm tired of it. Uh. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, when it'll come, it, it won't be as good as like the anticipation for it, you know. No, no, it might be now. I don't think it will be because, like, I think as dope as like, oh, take Keith is there and and reason and and chase the money and and Ti and and uh Wale and Crit. I think we go listen to like, oh, these some dope songs. <laughs> what else are we supposed to do? But what I'm saying, like, I think people like, sound like, oh my gosh, the greatest rappers ever. They're all in one place. Now we're gonna get the best album of all time. And I, I, I'm just, I'm just, I guess it could be that way. I'm just gauging my expectations because I'm pretty sure when I hear it, I'm be like, J. Cole rapping on like a Take Keith beat. I'm gonna be like, yeah, this is exactly how I thought it would be. And it's, kind of, you know, the kids gonna love it, but it ain't for me. Shut and, up. I, I, that's just how I feel, man. Like, if, if, because like when people be like, yo, Off D's is Cole's best verse ever. I'm like, is punchlines all it takes? Like, I could, like, anybody could write that. Like, it's just like clever lines. Like, on, on a really cool beat, like any uh, part of that, I'm just like, it's it's way more impressive to me that Cole can write a song like Change or uh, freaking Ville Mentality or For Your Eyes Only than it is like a verse on Off D's. It's like that's much harder to do to tell a compelling story and like get make such vivid imagery in a song. I think, but you know, people got different priorities, so they can feel how they want to feel. Um, I just I just want Big Crit to produce something that J Cole raps on. That's all I want. I'm gonna be the Will Smith of this generation. The what? The Will Smith of this generation. Hey, you gotta watch Enemy of the State, my G. And Hancock again. 
I gotta watch Six Degrees because I didn't do it yesterday. Why didn't you? You were just like, you, I was doing shit. It's too serious, man. I ain't trying to watch that. I'll be like that I sometimes. Got stuff to do. You don't, you don't ever be like that. you are like, I'm gonna watch this tonight, and then you're like, man, I don't wanna watch this. When you make the decision to watch it, you you know, it, it feels like it feels like a burden. Then sometimes I just put stuff on, I'm like, yeah, I like this. But when I like make the decision, like I've been waiting to watch this, I'm gonna watch it today, and I'm like, dang, I'm dreading it. Like it's like it's homework. I actually had stuff to do. Um, Say good for me. Yeah, man. But yeah, you got to see Animated State, bro. He is so good in that movie. And that's such a great movie. Well, well you know, he's the best. So I, I don't doubt it. I still think Hancock is one of his best performances. Underrated. One of my favorite superhero movies, period. Mm. Uh, what, what what would you have said to the Will Smith question? Would you have said Pursuit of Happiness or Ali, which is pretty well, good? Well, when I if I had to show somebody? Yeah, would it be Ali? Probably Ali. Yeah. He is Only because that's one of his best performances. Yeah, he's pretty great in Ali. And Pursuit. And uh, probably Focus just because it's fun. Oh, my gosh. He's so good in Focus. Yeah. So good in Focus. is a lot of fun. The, uh, I still think that if Men in Black International ain't got a a Will Smith or a Tommy Lee Jones cameo or something, then it's a it's a bust. No matter how good the movie is. How you feel about um, Bad Boys Three? I don't care. They both old and stuff, you know. I don't. That doesn't really matter to me. Of course it don't. I mean, I, don't, I, mean, I don't care. Like I just want to see Will do more interesting stuff. Like I, like I've seen Bad Boys and Bad Boys Two. I don't think I need a third one. How do you feel about it? Uh, exactly, right? No, I could use it. But it's not its not like one that you're clamoring for. No, but I mean, it might be great, so. That's fair. Not only in great and your great, I'm talking about great and my great. Yeah. Uh, something else I was going to ask you. I just lost it again. Yo, it's wild. Um, oh, are you uh, are you bummed out that Will Smith ain't doing more movies? What you mean? Like he he ain't been in none recently. He got some stuff coming out this year. You gotta wait. Yeah, he got stuff coming out this year. But I'm just saying, like, where's the where's the new new? You know what? Where's the new new? I think he got Bright 2 coming soon or whatever. We got Bright 2. We got Gemini Man. He got Aladdin. He got, oh, yeah, Aladdin. He got Bad Boy. I think he's going to be good in it, but I just don't care about Aladdin. Yeah, I don't. I didn't. It was one of my favorites growing up, so, but because he's in it. Yeah, right? Like, you want to watch it because it's him, but it's like, do we, does anybody care about Aladdin like that? Like, people love Genie, but do people love Aladdin? I don't know. I love Will, but I want to see him in something like us. Nah, he ain't finna do that, bro. If he didn't take Django, know. if he didn't take Django or The Matrix, he ain't finna take something like us. I know, and I and I get it now. This lady is career. He's just trying to get to the money, which I get. But I just would have liked one or two more of those from him. I think I think he still can do it. Like Enemy of the State is a very much. I'm gonna keep. I'm gonna keep banging this one until you watch that movie. That's. I mean, that's very much a movie where he plays just a normal guy. Who gets tangled up in like in a weird government conspiracy? I like I watched the in, the very ending of that movie on YouTube the other day because we were talking about Will Smith, and the end of that movie is so weird and violent and like <laughs> and like the kind of movie that I'm like Will Smith don't really make movies like this anymore. Like this is like a really odd movie, but those kind of movies just don't get made anymore. The kind of movies that Will Smith got famous off, like uh. like. Like, those kind of movies go straight to Netflix. Like, Bright is the closest we get, but I don't think Bright is nearly as good as something like Men in Black, which is unfair because Men in Black is, like, perfect. But you don't think it's nearly? I don't know I about that. I think Men in Black is a, is a legitimately perfect movie. I, I don't think... I think very few movies are better than Men in Black. That first one. I, I get you feeling like that. I mean, it, it's kind of perfect. It's really, like, heartfelt and, and real. Like, uh... Listen to this quote from it that uh that uh what's his name said Tommy Lee Jones when, they, when remember when he first uh was talking about Men in Black and like why aliens are hidden in the world and stuff 
this is what Tommy said to Will. He said, uh, okay, yeah, he said 15, he said, people are smart. Uh, why don't you, no, no, this is what Will says. He said, people are smart. Why don't you tell them the truth? They can handle it. And then Tommy Lee Jones says, no, a person is smart. People are dumb and scared. Like, that's a really deep message to tell, like, a big blockbuster, a blockbuster movie. And then later on, he says this. This is what Tommy Lee Jones says to Will right after he shows him the MIB base. Tommy Lee Jones says, uh, he says, 15 years ago, everybody knew the Earth was the center of the universe. 500 years ago, everybody knew that the Earth was flat. 15 minutes ago, you knew that humans were alone on this planet. Imagine what you'll know tomorrow. I saw this thing a couple days ago, too, because it was circulating for some reason. From Men in Black, the first one? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he told him that on the bench right after he asked yes, the first one. exactly, yeah. And, and then he was like, um, this is just a, so what's the catch? You cease all contact with anybody in the outside, ever. And then he was like, is it worth it? He was like, yeah, if you're strong enough. Like, that's a real movie with real, like, you watch that movie, like, man, they tell you some real stuff in there. You don't see many blockbusters with deep, heartfelt, like, really thought-provoking uh, stuff like that. I mean, remember the end when Will has to, uh, has to uh, erase his mind from all of MIB? Yeah, and he's like, Jay, I cannot do this by myself. And then he's like, I just took down a, a intergalactic space, but he's like, and that's one of a thousand memories I don't want. Uh huh. Is that some real stuff? He said, like, like what he say? He said at the very end, right before he did, he's like, uh, you gonna remember? He's like, I'm gonna remember this day. And then he put on the glasses, and Will was like, you won't. And then he like clicked it. No, no, no. He was like, I'll, I'll see you around, kid. And they're like, no. Oh yes, that's what it was. It's a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. I, I really think Men in Black is kind of a perfect movie. But, uh, I like that. I really do get that. I like the third one. I love the ending because it ties back. Mm -hmm. I knew you love that ending. I On the beach, and I was just like, because he just saw it, he was like, okay, and, oh, when they go to the diner, he was like, I understand now. So now thank you. He like, it's been my privilege. Because he just saw it. He, he, he knew all that stuff was going to happen. I was like, that, that's great. Might not make a lot of sense to a lot of people, but I really like the second one too. Like the second one gets a lot of crap, but I like I love the fact that like Will has to like let the love of his life go essentially. Yes. That's the first time I saw Rosario, and you know. She can't get much better than that. Um Yeah, so I hope the new one's good. You know, it don't look like it's gonna be as deep or as interesting as the Will Smith movies, but I hope they show I just want them to show up. Like I don't I don't want them to pretend like they didn't exist. Just let Will come in and be like What's up, AJK? Or like at the very end, after they beat the monster, or whatever, Tessa Thompson sits down in front of like, uh, was he K or J? I don't remember. It was J. Tommy Lee was K. Okay, just her sit down and like Jay's now like the commissioner of the MIB, and it's Will. He's like your next assignment is yada yada yada. I think that'd be dope. But uh, yeah, looking forward to any new movies coming out soon. Other than glass and you know whatever else, us. A lot of new Netflix movies coming out soon, like real soon. That like was, what? That new movie Velvet, Velvet uh, Buzzard Buzzsaw. That looks amazing. And that movie Polar is coming out. Velvet Buzzsaw is coming out the first of February, and Polar is coming out on the twenty fifth of uh, this month. And I think there's another movie with Anthony Mackie about being the last humans on Earth coming out on the eighteenth of this month. Okay. And there's a TV show called Bad Education that just came out today that I'm finna watch all this weekend because I hear it's amazing. So, yeah, I'm, I'm hyped. That's all. That's all. Yeah, that's all I got. Um, anything else from you? or? Uh, no, we probably should start recording an hour ago. Yeah, it's fine. We ain't need all that other stuff on there. Well, I don't know what else we're going to add. We'll just, we'll just have this at the top of something else. I got a post I ain't posted yet. It'll be cool. You got a lot of stuff you ain't posted. Hey, you know. Um, all right, man. What what was something else? Uh, the three pillars of hip hop. Yeah. Uh. I mean, I don't really have an opinion on that. I don't really know. I heard, All right, what you want to talk about? Uh, <laughs> I, I saw uh, somebody was somebody. It was a first listen review of the Jid album, 
and uh, somebody said listen to DiCaprio too was uh like listening to early Drake. Uh, the like back when he was like he had the ambition to be better than uh better than Wayne who was above him, and just think about where Gia could be in relation to Cole someday. I was just like, that's interesting. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I wasn't I wasn't mad at it. I was just like, are you where you were? I, I mean, I was just like, you ain't really got to say that. You know what I mean? I'm like, <laughs> I think nobody asked you like, man, this man could be better than Cole. So I'm like, yeah, we don't. Nobody asked. Really got to say, say that. Great, say it's a great record. You know what, what if he? True though. I mean, I mean, it's definitely possible. I mean, that's what you want, right? If you if you sign someone, you want them to be bigger than you. I mean, no. Cole is definitely bigger than Jay at this point. People would argue. I mean, yeah, musically he is. Musically, but Jay kind of lives on. Yeah, Jay is kind of like a like a, a famous like like mogul at this point. Like he's, I think he's more known for being like a businessman and marrying Beyonce. He's famous for just being famous at this point. Yeah, he's just Jay Z. Like you just know who Jay Z is, you know. So I get that, but you know, that's what you want. I mean, Kanye kind of did that for Jay. He became bigger than Jay, I'd say, at least for a minute. Yeah, that's true. Mm-hmm. But what does that have to do with what I'm talking about? Oh, I was just saying. No, I, was, I was just bringing it up. It's an interesting point. But uh, no, nah, I mean, I don't know. I don't. I don't consider them the three pillars because they're very. That ain't what I was asking you though. You asked me. You asked me what I thought I'm about that. Go into detail on each one. On what I thought about each one? No, on they on their placement in hip hop. What are they to hip hop? Well, I think uh, for me at least, I think Drake is the is the kind of like worldwide accessibility of what hip hop is. And I think I think uh, I think Drake's value is under under value, is underrated because he makes such hit records and such pop records that people want to either underestimate his writing ability and his ability to make good rap songs and his impact on the culture. I, I mean, the thing I hate most is when people talk about, like, oh, Kanye changed the face of hip-hop and, you know, Jay-Z and all this, but I'm like, Drake changed it more than any of them. Like, Drake, Drake, to, like, people say, well, that wouldn't be a Drake without Kanye. Like, yeah, okay. Like, that wouldn't be a Kanye without KRS-One. But you you don't big up KRS-One over Kanye. So it's, like, to me, Drake changed hip-hop completely. Like, all the people talking about, like, Oh, there wouldn't be a there wouldn't be a singing people without Kanye. There wouldn't be these dudes who felt like they okay being themselves without Kanye. Like, nah, that's no, 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 I say it's about Cuddy. I mean, people say that, but they be like, yeah, but they say like there wouldn't be a Cuddy without Kanye, which is true. And they say they wouldn't be like a there wouldn't be Juice Worlds and Uzis in them without like a Kanye and, and like a Wayne. Like I was like, no, there wouldn't be a Juice World and an Uzi in them without a Drake and a Wayne. Like it's it's so obvious that Drake's impact it had because as much as we like. Kanye was different in a time when it was okay to be different. Kanye was wearing polos instead of chains. And it's like, yeah, but Kanye was still like rapping about bravado and being cocky. Drake was the first one that came out here and was like, I just want this girl to love me and she don't love me no more and I don't know what to do with myself. Like, Kanye wasn't rapping about that. And Drake that, was cocky too, though. No, no, no. I'm not saying he couldn't be. I'm saying like he definitely could. I think that's what I think Wayno said it too. He's like, Drake's ability to hop on any record is crazy. The way he's able to hop on like Hood records, the way he's hopping on like, like gangster records, like pop records, uh, R and B records, uh, you know, the sentimental, introspective records, the bar you up records, like, and now you know Spanish records and stuff. It's like unmatched, and like I agree with that, but also in the sense that like Drake has had the biggest impact on hip hop than any other hip hop artist ever has, and I, I, I don't like people always say like no Com- Tupac, Biggie, no, it's, it's not even close. Every everybody who's popular today, every Juice World, every Uzi, every Famous Dex, every all of them, listened to Drake at some point, and were like fans of Drake because they were young enough to they were young enough to realize to know when Drake was popping. Drake has been around and been the biggest thing in the world for so long that he has literally had the span of like in 2009 when he came, people like Juice World were like nine years old, you know what I mean, and now they're like making music, so they grew up with Drake and now making their own music. And, and Drake, was, <laughs> Drake was, was, they weren't on. They were like thirteen. Yeah, yeah, but they were young enough to be like not making music themselves and just in like digesting popular music. And these aren't guys who are going back listening to uh, to like M- old Eminem records. They're listening to like what's on the radio at the time, which was Drake and like Wayne and you know Kendrick to, to some extent and Cole <laughs> to some extent. But 
like all these new people are definitely children of all of these big rappers of that time who continue to be big, but like obviously Drake is the biggest thing. And I don't think Drake gets enough credit it at all. Like nobody gives him enough credit. They don't give him enough credit for being so varied on his albums, for being so forward thinking in terms of what, what's coming musically, so willing to like change his style for the sake of his artistic growth. Like all this stuff is done and people just look at it and be like Oh man, I ain't like Scorpion as much as I like Take Care, or I ain't like it as much as I like More Life, but it's cool. And then, but I bet in like two years, they'll be like, yo, Scorpion was better than what people thought it was. Like, that's that's always what happens with Drake records. Every single time. Are they doing it when nothing was the same now? Yeah, I see that all the time. I, I see a lot of like, nothing was the same as Drake's best album. I see that with like views now. I, I saw people being like, hey, views was low key a great album. I'm like, where were y'all in 2016 when people was like, <laughs> Drake, you know, Drake, Drake fell off. I remember when 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 uh, views dropped, people were like, uh, Drake ain't never gonna be bigger than this. This is it, man. And he disappointed. Yeah, you, said that too, though. you ain't saying no that, but you was like, it wasn't. No, no, no I agree. Like Drake albums always have to grow on me. Ever since like, uh, since nothing was the same, Drake albums have grown with me. Like, uh, if you're reading this was the album, I was like, that's cool. First time I heard it, and now it's like one of my favorite albums. So, like, I, I never knocked Drake for like not catching me on the first hook. Like most artists don't, so you know if I go back to your music, that means something. And I just think like as time goes, people are gonna look back and be like that that Scorpion album is really good. Cause I listened to Scorpion album, then I was like, this is really good. What are you talking about? Like it's like I don't, it's not my favorite. I don't think it's his best work, but I think it's a really good album. I think people just kind of crap on it because they like well, we expect more from Drake. He's the biggest in the world. It's like he's giving y'all the future. And in ten two years, when everybody's making this type of music that's on Scorpion, you're gonna be like, well, Scorpion really did start something. But nobody will give Drake that credit, which I think is unfortunate. And I think they give Kendrick too much credit when he all the time. This ain't a bashing segment on Kendrick. I'm not bashing Kendrick. I love Kendrick to death. But like I listen to like I don't like that Black Panther album. That's no, 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 Ian. Don't do that. Go to go to Kendrick next. You talk about Drake. Now what is Kendrick in here for? Are you trying to bash that man? <laughs> I was like, well, Ken- Kendrick is essentially like if Drake is like the pop sensibility, Kendrick is like a, the kind of poster child for important hip hop music. And they're the two, I guess the two polar opposites, not polar opposites, but they're the two pinnacles of what, when you think of hip hop music, you think of Kendrick Lamar and you think of Drake. You think of Drake is like the pop star, the guy who like smiles on the red carpet, who dates the girls, who does all these things. You think of Kendrick, you think of the guy with the Peabody, the guy who made Tip of Butterfly, the guy who wears cornrows in public, like that guy. Um, <clears throat> And and they're the kind of like when you think of hip hop, they're the kind of the two things that you think of. So I think Kendrick represents this kind of like this almighty thing of like people like, oh no, this is important music as well as being very good and very marketable and very entertaining. But I honestly and I think Kendrick Kendrick Lamar's impact is probably overinflated because of his because he is very popular and his music is so good and so important that people overinflate his impact of what he means to the culture because the culture. I hate that fucking word. Um, so, while I understand uh, his, his his point, let me, let me try to see what I'll say this. My problem with Kendrick is that he's never moved me to the point where I'm able to fully see the amount of, the level of attention that they put him on. And that's not a fault of him. I think he's one of the greatest rappers of all time, and I love his music to death. It's just that when I hear the way people talk about him, I like, I, I can see what you mean, but I don't feel it when I listen to his music. Um, and I think a lot of people don't feel it. I think it's just very smart, very well-made music, and they, and because they're able to intellectualize it, it I mean, that's like what most artists, if you feel like you're able to like digest it and dissect it, that there is more meaning in it, and that's kind of what Kendrick does. He's made that a popular art where, you know, a lot there's a lot of more music dissection online, especially in hip-hop music, because of the music that Kendrick Lamar has put out, and there's a lot more awareness of uh, hip-hop music as protest music because of Kendrick Lamar. I mean, if there wasn't a Kendrick Lamar, hip-hop music would probably still be party music and it'd probably still be, you know, fun dance music. But Kendrick Lamar made it something, at least in the mainstream, that is, like, considered considered art worthy of uh, inspection beyond simply the construction of it. So it's it can be looked at on the same level of, like, a, like Kamasi Washington. Like, Kamasi Washington makes instrumental music that is, like, grand and very, like, very much uh, inspired by jazz and uh, classical music. And you can look at that as like the construction of it as a, it's like a piece of music, how intricate the the, the, uh, the octaves and the beats and the 
time signatures and all that stuff. And Kids Lamar does it in the same way, but with lyrics in conjunction with music. So it's not just a construction of what the party's on, the words and the meaning behind it and the overall concept of the albums mean something in a grander scheme that people can, one, easily identify, but also in themselves dig into and find meaning in, which I think not only is important, but also uh, perpetuates importance of the music more than other hip hop stars, right? Because, I mean, you look at like a Vince Staples or an Abso or Earl Sweatshirt or Tyler Crater. Like these guys make really intricate music that you dive into and you can find layers in. But those guys wouldn't be as popular, as known, or as talked about musically if not for Kendrick Lamar, I don't think. Even if Kendrick Lamar didn't exist and those guys did, that kind of music would still be really relegated to underground. But these guys are very mainstream acts making this kind of music. and People know them and they have a lot of followers and, you know, big tours. And I think that's because Kendrick Lamar made the kind of like intellectual hip hop music popular on a, you know, in a grand sense, I think. And the last one. Oh, I mean, Cole. Cole can you be objective? I'm, I'm going to try to, because I've been thinking about this. Cole's an interesting anomaly in that I don't understand why he's popular as he is. It makes no sense to me. Because as much as I think Cole's important, as much as I think his music is is powerful and deeply felt, I mean, well, I, there are th- ways in which I think he is important. I think I can, I can like, quantify why he is as big as he is, because his music is so, at least the ones I love, like For Your Eyes and Born Center specifically. I mean, those two albums for me are, I mean, people don't even like For Your Eyes that much, so it might not even count. But those music, th- those songs to me are as much about, you know, the interior life of, the interior life and humanity of everyday black people and gives perspective on that. And people always, people who are crit- critics of Cole always say things like, well, he just says things that you already know and you feel like because you feel it as well, it's relatable and that's what makes it deep when it's just simple. And I don't think that's the case at all. I think what he's doing is, um, personifying, giving voice to like this kind of universal, this universal struggle and universal POV of like black struggle and black insecurity and mental health issues and and pain and anxiety and all these things. And he does it in a way that's not only palatable, but he does it in a way that makes you feel what those moments and those feelings are and injects himself into it. And he's able to objectively look at it from the side and examine it and tell you why this is a problem. Um, sometimes he does that to the detriment of something. I mean, there are songs by him that I don't like because they feel like he's preaching to you. And I'm like, I, I get what you're saying, so you don't have to you know, go so hard on it. But there are songs like uh, like Ville Mentality where he just uses like uh, uses that recording of that girl saying those lines. And you're able to, at least I'm able to, pick like basically visualize this moment and see it over the course of what this album represents as this like, moment of truth where he's able to, one, concisely represent, like, say, essentially, the anxiety and the pain and the hatred and, like, the, the bravado and the misogyny that you feel is a reflection of you being a child who doesn't understand how to process their own feelings. And, he's, and he does that so concisely by having a little girl simply say, I miss my dad and I wish he was here, so I get mad and I lash out at my mom. And, that's, and, all, and when you listen to that, you say, okay, that's an interesting take. But then you really think about it, you're like, oh, no, no, what he's saying here is, we're all just children, and you know the moment that we get angry, or we hate each other, or we fight, or we kill each other, is just us not being able to deal with the fact that our dad was never there, or that we didn't get the we didn't get enough hugs of the love that we had when we were children. <clears throat> and people knock and people you know uh, chalk that up to being simple or easily digestible. I, I chalked it up to him being like really perceptive of the human the human condition, and his music reflects that in a major way. I mean, that's why I think a song like Love Yours means so much to people. Like, I don't like that song personally all that much, but I can see why it means so much to other people. Because when they hear it, it reflects like a thing in them that they weren't able to able to say. I think somebody asked them on Instagram, they're like, what's your favorite song ever here? Like, Love Yours. Yeah, I saw that too. Because I, I, I think that song is a very simple message and like, people already know this and like, people feel this, but they're not able to express it. And to hear someone like Cole say it back to them in a way that's not only enjoyable to listen to, clever and well-written and also really heartfelt and you know, deeply, you know, sung. Cause I, I mean, he sings with so much conviction, I think more than any other rapper. I mean, let me not say that. Uh, he sings with a lot of conviction in a way that I don't hear from other rappers. So when he says something like in a song, like love yours, people feel it and they know it and they say like, okay, this is why Cole is important. Well, I don't know. I wrote something one time. I was like, it was about the song for your eyes only. And it was like, 
Cole is important because this isn't my, I was like, this isn't my favorite Cole song, but this is the epitome of why J. Cole is important to rap music and why I think his, his, uh, his legacy is his kept and why he's so popular now is that he's able to one reflect the stories that are told throughout the course of hip hop music, but also he somehow in the course of telling these stories, he's able to impart on you the meaning of why these stories are important and why they need to be told. They're essentially the stories of people who die before their time or were neglected or exploited or taken advantage of. And he's giving them the voice to be like, this is how I felt in this moment. And I'm telling you this so you can finally hear this story that I never got to say because my life was ended too short or I'm not able to say it in the way as eloquently as that. You know what I'm saying? So it's like J. Cole is kind of the conduit for this kind of uh, subconscious anxiety and fear and pain that black people feel. I think he makes very, I think he makes music specifically about black people. And I think that's probably why his stuff is so resonant, which is odd because there's a lot of white people who love his stuff too. And a lot of white people who relate to us to albums like For Your Eyes Only. So I don't know what that means. Maybe they just, <clears throat> maybe it's just about empathy. And at the, at the end of the day, they feel it because they feel, I mean, there's a universality to that kind of anxiety. But I think he speaks to a very specific type of like black, especially in For Your Eyes Only. Um, I, I mean, I read like a, a, a feminist breakdown of that album once and she was saying like her problem with Cole is that he's really misogynistic it's like passively and people don't call him out on it and she can't listen to his albums because it's because he has songs like no role models where he basically demonizes women for wanting to have sex and being hoes and the, and she says she's hard to reconcile that but when she heard four year eyes only it was the first album where she where she heard like song like deja vu and she was like I can't believe J. Cole is deconstruction deconstructing the kind of misogyny that he puts in his music and he essentially saying like oh no 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 when I say, like, I don't fuck with her, I got bigger dreams, it's really me saying, all I want to do is be with you, and I'm and you don't want me, and so I just have to, you know, push you away because I can't deal with the fact that you don't like me. So I'm going to lash out and tell you that you ain't nothing but a hoe. And she was really struck by that. And she was like, it's, it's, and she was saying, like, this album means so much to me now because, one, I know it in reference to the old Cole music that was all these songs about these hoes and these ladies and all these things. But also him not only growing, but also him something that I've never seen a rap rap artists do, which is come to terms with their own inner like inner laden misogyny and where that comes from, and like all this stuff like that's all the all that what she examined and what I just said is all a reflection of like Cole literally like drilling into like the psyche of black men and being like this is what the problem is. Let me put it on this album, and expose it to the world, <clears throat> and a lot of people don't like when that album came out. People were like it's boring. I don't get it. And the more and more I go, I see people being like, oh, man, Four Yards only really ages well. Like, it, it, it bumps different now than it did two years ago. I see a lot of that. And I see a lot of, like, ever since I had my daughter, I, Four Yards only the album, like, listens differently than it did before. And I think that's what Cole does, at least for me. And I think that's why he's not, like, as big as Kendrick and Drake, is that his stuff is very insular and specific, but in a way that's broad and, like, not very specific. I can't even explain it. I don't know. I mean, it means a lot to me, obviously, but that's why I said I don't really understand why he's so big as he is. Cause if you don't, if you're not connecting to the music on an emotional level, it just sounds like a bunch of dude telling you stuff you already know. But if you feel it the way I feel it, it becomes like this, this very specific, but like general representation and concise representation of like feelings that I felt in a way that's like drilling into what those things mean. <clears throat> I'm, I'm gonna say one more thing and I'm gonna stop on code cause I've been talking too much, but there's a line on uh, Africarian, the uh, Logic song, where he says, he says, I'm like, oh, I should be, uh, I'm sorry, I'm you that. Okay, he says, are you running from something with hopes of becoming someone that's finally worthy of love? Let me tell you now, you're worthy enough. Fuck approval from strangers. That shit is dangerous as hell. Find God, learn to accept yourself. And I heard that. I was like, wow, like that's such a concise way to say that in a way that's not like overly complex or overly like, heady or difficult to understand he's he essentially just said are you running from something with hopes of becoming someone that's finally worthy of love let me tell you now it's one it's one it's like such a simple line but it's like well, this is why cole is important he literally puts in words these things that like we don't know what we're feeling and when he says that we're like oh my gosh he said it like all these things i've done is just me just trying to fight the fact that i don't think i deserve this thing so you know that's why i think cole is important at least to me <clears throat> All right, that's all. Uh, yeah, I've been talking a lot. If you have to label each one, what are they? Uh, in terms of what? 
Hip hop. Just in general, like just a word or a label, any any label. A title, a label, or something. What would you label them? I don't have an answer. This is for you. Yeah, I don't know what I would label. They're very broad. Exactly, it's supposed to be. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. The worst part about all that was the woman you were telling me, the talking about the, the feminist thing. Yeah. I just think that people have so much time on their hands these days that, that they can actually sit through that and believe that that's a real thing. I mean, that, it, was, her, that was her opinion. She was just like, she just doesn't like it because of those points. And then she liked for it as but, because it was the opposite of that. That's all. She's been saying that it's bad. Shut up. That. <laughs> but no, it's very much like. I just don't like her opinion at all. I hated that. I hate that she feels a way about. I hate that she feels that strongly about that. I hate that she sat through that music and found that. And it it really makes me hate like people who do that kind of stuff. It's like you need something else with your life to do than to sit there and go through music to find that kind of stuff. And it's like I don't even believe any of that's in there. I really don't. And it's like I listen to his music a lot of it. I don't. I don't think so. I listen to that music a lot, and it's like, even it's like her feeling away. Just like I don't want you to be. I don't. You don't need. Like I, I want him to be misogynistic to you, because it's like I, I don't think you deserve. You, you don't deserve happiness. I don't know why. I don't know why th- that bothers me that much. But it's like, it bothers me yeah. that you sit through that and find that reasoning. It's like, I feel like we don't need. It's not hard to dig for stuff these days. Like, it's a lot of stuff we, we, we can put our attention to. You put your attention to some music. Mm-hmm. It's just like, I feel you. you so, no, it's just like a, a lot of people these days, like, they want to fight a cause so bad, they'll become so misguided and so, like, so jaded by, like, everything. And it's like everything has, like, some meaning behind it. And I'm very much into conspiracy theories and I don't trust anything white people do. So it's like, I'm I'm already there, but it's like, with white people, I'm, I'm, I don't give them the benefit of the doubt. So it's like, you know, I, I think I have some understanding of why I do that. But it's just like, with something like this, like, it's so much stuff to be fighting for or trying to, like, to decode and find nuance in. And you go to that and it's just like, for that to be such a problem for you, it's just like, I don't know. I don't, like, is there a word for, like, uh, like femininity that, that's, like, toxic? I guess it would be toxic. Femin- I think that's a thing now. <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm for real. Yeah, I mean, I agree to disagree, but you know. Um, no. Uh, all right, that's fine. You know, I think that I think I, I think that there is toxic masculinity, and I think it is rife. And you got to look too hard in this country to find it. It's basically what this country is built off of: men being dominant to subservient people, whether they were black women or whatever. But now I think it has shifted so much to where, like, I think people want their power back so much, like, w- women first. I think, like, it's turned to a point now where it's like, you're trying to find things where there aren't things, and you'll alienate, like, yourself from people who are actually on your side. And it's like, because everything isn't an issue. And, again, I'm the last friend that should be saying it because I think everything white people do is an issue. So, mm-hmm. But with stuff like that, it's like, you could be doing something else. And I feel like we, as a generation, have way too much time on our hands to do stuff like that. And I, I think it's almost like a, um, a mechanism of, like, I'm bored so much. I need to do something to keep our day in. Back in the day, you really didn't have time for all that. You was like, you had to work and provide for your family. Now, we're so taken care of. Yeah. Um, we have time to decode music and find masculinity. It's like, I don't think we do enough deep dive on ourselves, and that's why I don't really think we know ourselves as well. That's why I think everything we think is a problem isn't, especially when it comes to stuff like that, but but I'm done. I just hate it, yep. that whole part that you was talking about, because it's like, I'm you just... I'm, I'm you, you, what? I'm talking to Carmen. Oh, uh, like, you could just be doing so much more, and it's like... Bye, gone. She's still there. Close the door, Carmen. Hey, Carmen. All right. Yeah. Uh, I was just like, yeah. I think there's a, such a thing as toxic femininity, femininity, and I think that should be explored more. But whatever. Mm-hmm.
Okay, that's interesting. Close the door, Colin. Um, what was I about to say? I mean, what what if you like at a party with Jasmine? You was just talking to people, and you were like, "Hey, what y'all think of Jay Cole's new album?" And the girl's like, "Yeah, I don't listen to him. I mean, his, his music's kind of misogynistic, so I just don't kind of I don't vibe with it." And she just left it at that. Would you be like, like "What?" Would you call her out? Or would you be like, I don't know, I don't I'd probably be like, that's crazy, and then move on. I ain't going to be like, what if like well, It's not crazy. It's my opinion. I'm going to say, you you can be wrong. And she'd be like, uh, that's kind of rude. I mean, it's just an opinion. I don't tell you you're wrong for, for liking them. i say your toxic femininity, your femininity is rubbing me the wrong way. Wow. Okay. This just gets loud. Uh, I'm a, you, you can lower your voice. <laughs> like, oh, now you're telling me what I should do. <laughs> and I'll be like, oh, man, my... I, I'd hate to disarm you. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta leave because y'all are causing problems. Um, I gotta, I gotta move. Yeah.